there are a few things more iconic than the shape of the Brody helmet or the Doughboy helmet that I'm wearing. But really, until World War I, it had been the late Middle Ages since armies had gone into combat with steel helmets. In fact, armies went into combat, the American army went into combat, even when they should have known better, went into combat wearing campaign hats or kepis of cloth. And what the armies found out was that the shrapnel wounds were so extensive that soldiers needed protection. Shrapnel wounds from explosives and shells exploding up in the air and essentially falling. So soldiers needed protection from falling debris. And that's where you get the Doughboy helmet or the Adrian helmet of the French or the Stahl helm of the Germans, all meant to protect me from falling shrapnel. I've worn a lot of helmets in my time. This is probably the least, I wouldn't say least comfortable, but it always feels like it's on the verge of popping off. I will say that. During World War II, there got to be an urban legend about wearing of the chin straps with the helmet. And it was said that the concussion from explosions would lift the helmet. And if your chin strap was on, it would lift your head with it. Um, that's of course, you know, one, not good military practice, and, and two, probably urban legend. Um, but the same legend and myth applies to the First World War as well. You rarely see folks wearing that chin strap, and indeed, I'm not wearing it right now. Um, but I can, if I was going into battle, I would certainly have it on because I don't think this helmet would stay on my head longer than about 10 seconds if I was running uh, without popping off. The Great War was also the First War where the armies all seem to fully embrace this idea of camouflage in uniform. So no longer did you see the British marching out in red coats with gold facings. Everyone adopted some form of either khaki, like the Americans, like I'm wearing right now, um, or steel gray or field gray, like the Germans wore. In fact, the only ones who were slow to adopt a more camouflage color were the French. It was actually a bit of a point of political pride that they march out in their blue uniforms with red trousers. Not very camouflaged on the battlefield. And it took the casualties of the first few months of World War I to really get people over the idea of pride in uniform and into, we need to protect our soldiers. So they tried to protect their pride, so the story goes, by coming up with something called a tri-weave fiber that had the red, white, and blue of the French flag weaved together. And weaved together, it made kind of a muckle dung purple, um, which was close enough to like a field gray to kind of be acceptable. The problem, or so the story goes, is that the dye needed to make the red was actually sourced from Germany, where they obviously couldn't get it. So that left a blue and a white thread in this tri-weave, which made a lighter blue. And so the French went to battle in a light blue called a horizon blue uniform and helmet. Um, folks say that it's called horizon blue because it was camouflage as well. It blended into the horizon, into the sky. Um, I haven't seen definitive proof one way or another whether it was the lack of the red dye or pride or a, a genuine belief that horizon blue was camouflage, but regardless, it made for a distinctive uniform. So one of the new weapons of war during the Great War was the use of poison gas. And ever since, the use of poison gas has been essentially forbidden uh, in use by world conflicts. That hasn't stopped their use, but certainly has stopped the widespread use that we saw during the First World War, where all sides were using it and it became part of essentially life during the war. So uh, the gas mask is in the bag that hangs for American soldiers around their neck. Um, and what they did is, you know, American factories made millions of gas masks based on a British model. So there'd be a call that there was gas, gas. And the idea was you reach down into this bag and you pulled out a gas mask and you, as hurriedly as possible, you 
you got this on your face. Fighting in this seems like it would be near impossible. The sense of claustrophobia, the sense of claustrophobia is just intense. So wearing this for any amount of time, you know, just obviously kind of gives you goosebumps. Of course, gas was prey to the wind, so the wind could blow your own gas back at you. Um, it could pull up in the, the deep uh, places on the battlefield, like shell holes or trenches. Uh, now, unfortunately, those deep places on the battlefield are where essentially people are most, uh, most safe other times. So you had to stay out of essentially your safe spots as long as the gas might linger. So this use of gas and gas masks just is a very unique feature of the Great War. Um, not something I've had to carry along with me on other history hikes. Soldiers in the Great War found a way to fill up a lot of their spare time in the trenches by essentially using what they had, shells in just the millions, empty shells um, and bits and pieces of military hardware and they made what's called trench art. And that could be anything from, uh, for instance, a cigarette uh, or an ashtray uh, made out of the base of a, a shell, or it could be something like this. This is a letter opener uh, that's made out of essentially military hardware hinges um, and pieces from an ammo box. Um, and it was made in the trenches, and it's a piece of genuine trench art, this letter opener. Now, I don't know who carried it, but someone made it. Um, more than likely someone in the trenches. Um, and the dates 1914, 1915, and 1916 are engraved on this letter opener. Now, of course, the war ends in 1918, so it, it does make you wonder what happened to the maker of this letter opener. So one of the questions that always comes up with the Great War is why were American soldiers called doughboys? And this is one of those things where it's, it, it's, it's now in the, the territory of myth and legend. There's no official explanation. The one I've heard that, that explains it best is that the Americans had perfected um, essentially a, a mobile kitchen, as, as most armies had at that point, to get essentially hot food closer and closer to the lines. But the Americans had made strides that the other armies had not made. And thus, their kitchens, especially their bakeries, were able to get closer and closer to the front lines. So Americans, where everybody else was using some form of, of essentially biscuit or hardtack, Americans had more just fresh bread. And hence, they became known as doughboys because they had this luxury of the fresh bread at the front rather than hardtack or hard bread. I hope that's true. I hope that's true. If only because I'm tired of eating hardtack on these videos. So the Great War heralded a revolution in, in many things and more than just weapons related. For instance, rations. The Americans called them iron rations because they had to be protected from contamination by gas. So unlike other wars where you could, you know, throw everything in a haversack, you had to actually protect it. So you had prepared rations that were protected by being in a tin, um, and they came in many shapes, sizes, colors, um, depending on the foundry that made them. Um, you know, even the ubiquitous hardtack had to be protected from gas and carried like in a tin. So that was the iron ration, something that could last, stored in a tin, uh, and could be carried in a soldier's pocket or in their pack. Um, you know, in a war of essentially stagnation, you know, most food wasn't iron rations. Most food could be provided by field kitchens. But when you were in combat uh, or isolated, you had these iron rations. So what I thought was most fun, fun about these iron rations is, I mean, they were not meant to be at all um, 
a gourmet's delight. Um, the most fun thing about it was you, you got a essentially a hunk of chocolate, which you find is kind of common to rations throughout the 20th century. Chocolate. Chocolate has a lot of calories, gave a burst of energy. So you find uh, just a, a hunk of chocolate. But you also found in the iron ration from the Americans a kind of beef bouillon mixed with this these grains and cooked wheat in and pressed into a kind of cake um this is like a granola type bar but it's, you know the closest thing i could think of to you know once that would all combine and press so kind of like this but with meat on it you know kind of a meat sauce on it um and the idea was you could dissolve it in water or just eat it plain but it's certainly unique it's like here here's your 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 wheat and and beef powder cake. I can't imagine it was very good. The time came for an attack out of the trenches. How do you coordinate an attack or signal an attack? It could stretch hundreds of yards, miles. You use watches. The wristwatch is an invention for the First World War so you could synchronize an attack. And you signal an attack with a whistle. The Allies were much more likely to have, even though they've been used for years, much more of a temporary feel to their trenches. Uh, on purpose, the idea that if you provided something that was much more fortress-like, it would somehow inspire men not to attack German trenches were triumphs of engineering and foresight. Uh, I saw a World War I historian once said that they, they thought of everything. Uh, just concrete and dugouts and bunkers and electricity and just, just everything that they could possibly need. And the difference is probably the fact that the, the Germans were an attacking force that had moved into foreign territory and had decided to stay. Uh, didn't want to be pushed away. Uh, whereas the French and the British were trying to push. Their whole idea was they didn't want to hold anything. They wanted to push Germany back. And that accounted for a little bit of the difference. But I'm sure that for an American soldier in a trench, where your boots are filling up with mud or clay, as it really was in the Western Front, you kind of would have been okay with defense. <laughs>